faire cette étude en Afrique, où il n'y a pas de masque, pas de traitement, pas de réanimation, un peu comme c'est fait d'ailleurs pour certains, certaines études dans le sida. Alors vous avez raison, et d'ailleurs on est en train de réfléchir en parallèle à une étude en Afrique justement pour, pour faire ce même type d'approche avec le BCG, un placebo. Euh, je pense qu'il y a un appel d'offres qui est sorti ou va sortir et je pense qu'on va en effet euh, sérieusement réfléchir à ça aussi. Ça n'empêche pas qu'en parallèle on puisse réfléchir à une étude aussi en Europe et en Australie. Hi everyone. Um, well, again, very happy to be with you guys here today. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get to to taste the delicious food of, of Anna, Anna's kitchen, by the way. So we have to go for something a bit more uh, dry, right? Anyways, um, so I was very, very shocked by by what those uh, those two uh, professors, doctors, whatever you want to call them. Um, what we're saying, you know, while exchanging on, uh, on uh, that French channel. And uh, I was at the same time, you know, shocked, but also not really surprised. Um, I thought that, you know, um, the whole idea of uh, being openly racist uh, on, online was over, right? Racism still exists, but I, I was hoping that at least they wouldn't do it uh, in a in an obvious way, and I was very wrong, and that's actually what shook, uh, shocked me the most. And first of all, they need to apologize, that's one thing to those two professors. They have to apologize for what they said because um, it's very racist, um, uh, and also it's, it goes against international law, that's the, same, that's the second thing. So um, if they don't apologize, at least they have to be taken accountable. And then if the authorities who try to do not do that, then the French authorities are accomplice, accomplice of their, their crime. Uh, in my opinion, that kind of speech has no place in our world anymore. And it is for us, um, African people, African young people, um, both on the continent and diaspora, to, to make sure um, that we are respected the way we support. Yeah, I'm surprised, he's surprised. Because- Exactly, exactly. Like, I'm disappointed, but I'm not surprised. We all knew this was going to happen in one way or the other. Why is this so? And in their statement, this had, has happened before. This is not the first time. So there is the tendency of happening again. And why do we allow this to be done in our countries? So for me, I'm not going to go straight to the doctors. Even though I condemn what they said, I hold our leaders responsible because they have been allowing this to happen in our countries. So I'll go straight to our leaders. And we all remember, uh, I think the Congolese president, he came out, I stand to be corrected. He said he will allow them to run a test in his country. I don't know if I'm uh, out of line. Um, so it was the doctor. So we have a doctor who's in charge of, um, uh, you know, just like in any country, dealing with uh, pandemics and uh, uh, sanitary and health crisis. Um, as you know, each country would appoint somebody to, you know, to be the focal point for, for running the show. And um, the professor that, uh, that was appointed, uh, he's a doctor, he, he was the one who, who found the cure against Ebola, right? Um, so he's very well respected and very well, uh, well highly regarded uh, in the DRC, but also in the region and, you know, in his profession. Um, uh, it was just unfortunate that he was at the, the American embassy uh, and he was giving a speech that, in my opinion, was giving to him. Uh, in that speech, he was saying that uh, by June or July, uh, Congo uh, should be uh, testing the medicine because uh, we've been selected. Um, and the whole controversy was to know by who. I mean, who selected you? And, you know, for you to be selected, I mean, there's two processes. Either somebody said, well, uh, we want you to do it, right? Or, some, or yourself went and put your name in the basket and said, we would like to, to be a part of, of this, this experiment. Um, both ways are very wrong. Um, and this, this professor came out and said that we've been selected. Uh, and uh, other rumors came out and said that, you know, we've, uh, the, the Congress government has been given 47 million US dollars um, so that people can, can be tested. 
And, you know, all that didn't make a lot of sense because, you know, today I think Congo has 400 cases. The United States has uh, more than, uh, what, seven, 700 cases, 700,000 cases. Uh, we have maybe 20 deaths. The United States has around, uh, last time I checked, I think we are at 40,000 deaths. Something like that, 36 or 40,000 deaths. So it doesn't make sense for you to go and test your medicine uh, in a country where almost nobody has it. Of course, I understand the, the fear. Um, the fear is that because our infrastructures are very weak, especially the health infrastructures, it makes sense to say, well, you know what, maybe um, we should give them, um, we should give them a medicine, so um, a vaccine. That makes sense, but not try it. If you wanna try it, Anyone who, even people in university, they will tell you, when you want to try something, you have to try it on a big sample. And you don't find a big sample in Africa, you find it in Europe, in China, or in the United States. Yeah. I understand by my point. Yeah. They said what they said because our leaders have been allowing those things to be happening in Africa. And now you made, you made mention of weak infrastructures. These are some of the problems, and we go back to the leaders when we have weak infrastructures. So we cannot leave our leaders out of this. So I'm not uh, condoning or I'm not accepting what they said, mm -hmm. but I will put the blame like 90% on us, on our leaders, mm -hmm. because they are the cause of all this problem. Because now other scientists are working hard to find a cure. What are African researchers doing? Are we doing likewise? If we are taking the lead in some of this uh, scientific research, mm -hmm. We will be saying, okay, uh, maybe just imagine uh, DRC scientists going to run the test on Italians. This one will also make sense, and it, it will blow the mind of the world. So we have a job to, we have a role to play in this. So that, that's my take on this. Okay, I think, yes, we have to do more. We have to work on our like science in general, our technology, invest more in science and research, but I don't think that our leaders are accountable for the racism that is in the world. Apart from the French, like what the virus has done has just shown how the black man is still at the bottom of the food chain. Like even China, where the virus began at the moment, are being racist towards black people. That has nothing to do with our government. Like I understand that yes, we have a lot to do, we have a lot to invest. We probably, this is like a wake up call to our governments as well, that we also need to work on our own things because now we're just waiting for who, who will give us the virus, will it be legit, will it be connected to 5G? Like there's all these conspiracies going on and we have very little like leverage on the matter. But then at the same time, I don't see how our leaders are responsible for racist behaviors that is happening to us back I don't know. Yeah, so I, I get both points or like all, where all of you are coming from. Yeah, but with what you asked most was saying about the leaders, like for example, in China, like they have this, I'll say like mentality or like conception about Africans, like mainly because of how they are taught in their schools about what Africa is, like most like that is like a poor, like continent with hungry people and people who live on trees and stuff yeah and and like when people when the other people also go to africa and when our leaders come to them to beg for money and everything it kind of confirms what they think about us you know so i, I think that's the point where erasmus is coming from from they like our leaders being part because you uh if you because they see americans or like the westerners as heroes or something different people that they strive to be like in terms of development and, and everything but they really look down upon and like they see us as inferior because like they think your place is not nice your country is not nice you're always coming to ask for money my friend one of my <laughs> one chinese girl i met actually said like but you know you guys always come and ask us for money so we, we must be poor like that's what they think about us so i get the racism and like we shouldn't give any excuse to win that all because yeah and this but 
there is also a little bit of backing or something to why they behave that way. Apart from the, the, the color of our skin, they have this mentality that because our people come to them for money and everything, we are like a little bit inferior. But that also goes to say that like it's not right to be treated differently just because of something you have no control over. And that's what we are seeing in the world now. Yeah, that's all I can say about it. I've always been debating with Eunice that anything that is happening to us, mm. we have to be blamed for it, at least maybe 80%. Now, you, you talk about where do we uh, put our petition? Whom do we uh, talk to about this? What have, what have our leaders done already? How many of our leaders have come out to criticize what these doctors say? I mean, are you, are you saying that we should just uh, leave, I'm going to use a big word, our faith uh, in the hands no. of our leaders? No, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't take actions. I'm saying everything begins from the head, right? Like, I mean, in general, what has our leaders done? What have they done? Nothing so far. Not for my country. I don't know. It's just a, a bunch of the youth commenting, standing up for our right, just like what the, uh, well, the you guys are taking. You see? Well, I'd like to say, Erasmus, on that point that, like, today I was watching a couple of interviews, and actually there are a lot of experts from different kind of uh, countries. Like, what I was basically listening to was, was from Kenya, but the whole feed was giving me different people who have like they are mainly assets like you, we, we also need to understand that uh, most of the time these things maybe presidents do not directly intervene regardless of the fact that they may uh, they may not agree with it because of uh, relationship with countries because they now like, they will not get the loan no 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 it's, it's <laughs> help me help me finish like okay. what i mean is that now two two people, private people, have come up to say this thing. Yes, it's true, they are doctors, but they are not presidents. You understand? So as a president, like in, in view of international relationship, a relation, he cannot go out to speak like a president who is a public figure, go and speak against what a private figure did. Because that will ruin like the, 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 the relationship between countries. Although what he has said, what the people have said is very uh, very, I don't know how, I don't even have words to describe it. It's very disgusting what they said. Let me say it this way. It's very disgusting what they said. However, like, it's encouraging to see that other aspects of their own, like, of their same status, like doctors, uh, medical experts, are doing talk show concerning this thing and are not commending what they said. So we ought to understand also levels. Like, it's, at times it's too easy to say, okay, our leaders, yeah, true that they have a big share, like slavery began because some kings and queens sold their very own to white people. However, like, let's talk about the now, the today, uh, concerning this situation. What I personally believe is that uh, right now they have said what they have said. And as Bora was sharing the initiative that they are doing, which is for them to apologize, I believe that is a very great thing. On the other hand, I pray that this really will help us to be very vigilant in our countries in what we allow in the kind of medicine because some of these things can happen even under their nose because of poor you know, administration in our countries. Like this thing can happen anyways without, maybe the leaders do not agree on it, but because of poor administration and vigilance and everything, these things can happen. People will be dying, they will say coronavirus. I wanted to ask if it does the, the behavior of, uh, to say not to generalize, but the behavior of the Europeans uh, towards Africa cannot be justified by the, our leadership. Because if a person is mean, and because maybe I'm timid, is bullying me. Maybe somehow it's my fault too. But does it justifies the person, that that person's behavior? You know, it might be that that person is not really a friend or it's not really a kind person. You know, and measures should be taken towards that, not just only um, just saying, okay, you know what, 
we'll be friends, but I will, I'll be careful. But maybe we should take another direction of what about separation? You know, what about trying to hold our own? You know, so can, does that really justify the behavior of uh, the group? Because this is not the first time, and I don't think it, should, it will be the last time. And even if they don't talk about it, I think still they will do it, you know? So how do we solve these kind of issues first? And does our, our, the behavior of our leaders justify these kind of characters of the Europeans? So I also like to ask, like you, you did mention something like if someone is mean to you and like, like for no reason, like you shouldn't justify it. And I get that, like, of course, people sometimes, people, people just don't like people for no reason. But one question I also like to ask is why don't they like us? That's the question. That's a big question. Why are they being to us? Why do they always see us as inferior? Why do they always see the need to come to us, like to see us like the, the lab rats and everything? Why? Because they will, uh, France will never go to the US and, and say, I want to take my, my drugs on you. So why do they come to Africa? Why do they do that to us? Okay. Um, from the words of Bright, like using the word bully, normally why does someone bully you? Because they have something you don't, they, you have something they don't have. Normally, if I, if you have a sandwich and I'm a bully in school, I will come for, I will come for your sandwich. And in this case, resources, markets, human capital, like we have all that and like it makes sense why for example india when india started growing as an emerging economy there was so much fuss on contraceptives let's move a little bit far away from coronavirus on contraceptives and all these um family planning methods kind of narrow down the population narrow down the population people died women were botched in surgeries like Whatever you have, a bully, that a bully does not have a bully. I think the Western world is so jealous of Africa because of what we have. Disclaimer, that was <laughs> so jealous. No, sometimes you don't have to run away from the truth. You know, the way in our country, on our continent for 400 years, more than 400 years, they took everything they wanted. And now, uh, I, I remember uh, Bora saying something last time. We had five, they took four. Now they want to share the one with us also. And you see, now the world has become, uh, it's like a struggle for power. Mm. They want to know who is the strongest. So every country now is in the same competition. It's like mm. business. Everyone wants to make profit, and the person who makes more profit becomes the uh, most powerful. That's how it is. That's why I always come back to ourselves, our leaders, and we the youth. Come to social media, now we know so many things. Information travels so fast that we are able to respond to, which is good. But we have to understand, it's like business. Everyone is trading. So if I, want to, if I want to make more profit, I go to the place where I can get more profit. For example, if China wants to trade with USA, they're not going to make so much profit, so they will not go. They will rather go to Africa. And when they come to Africa, instead of our leaders or our policy makers coming out with strategies or ideas which will help with the Africans, they just go in for what will benefit them those individuals, they act on behalf of the whole, uh, the entire country or continent. They make profit and then the country is, um, is in a mess. So we have, we, they don't have what we have. They don't have what we have. I, I think that's a, basically the problem we are facing against the West. So it comes back to Sarah's question, like, we, we are in Belgium now and I would say Belgium has a lot. They don't have what we have, though. Like, they don't have in terms of resources and minerals and everything. But they are doing good. Uh, uh, I can say, like, they are they are taking care of their people. Like, they are, 
their welfare is good, they have good health care and everything. But when you look back into our countries, it's not the same. So what I may ask, if they are jealous of us, as you said, if I may, I may use the word, like what are they jealous of? Because they have everything. Well, I wouldn't want to drive us into that aspect because we all know the history. I will, I will prefer we stay on COVID-19. If no, you go, some, I, of, some of the discussions, we will go back. Now, if someone should be benefiting from you for over three centuries, come on, they are going to have a lot of stock, a lot of, I mean, money hidden somewhere. can blame them or we can say all those things, but we, we have most of the work is on our part. We have to do a lot more. With the same bully analogy, you can't just tell a bully that, you know what, just stop bullying me. He can choose to listen to you or not. What can you do? You can make yourself stronger. Then when he comes, you, you can also take him up on the fight. But it's like we, we still are like those timid people on the playground and always the bully is coming, the bully is coming, we keep on complaining. Oh, he's bullying me, he's bullying me. But we are not really doing anything about it. That's my, my, my idea about it. How many of you have heard uh, this? <laughs> you said it this, this Zoom with your call. So we are we do, I'm not, you know, it's part of also the pop culture. <laughs> and um, the question you just, the, the, the comment you just made is actually just, you know, uh, brought to my attention the fact that I've seen more um, people worried about how they'll be doing this challenge rather than how we can address and tackle this, uh, this issue. Um, you know, I've seen in my group of friends a clear divide. Uh, on one side, uh, people who, of course, also participate in the challenge, but also um, they're working actively to look for solutions. Uh, on how to start to well, to tackle this issue, um, namely that comment that was made, and also how um, only the, the 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 African people are addressing it. And on the other side, uh, I had a group of friends where we only deal of how am I going to be looking the best, you know, on the Dorrit challenge or um, any other mm -hmm. challenge. So, how do we how do we interest our people to what matters? Because you also have to understand that sometimes it's all about um, losing faith, losing faith in in something that you might believe being a, a battle that's already long lost. You think that, oh my God, these two white people said this on national television, you know, they said it because they know they are protected, we cannot do anything about it. Yeah. How can we make sure that people with that mindset actually change their mindset? How can we change their mindset? Because, you know, the two, four, the six of us here, the six of us here are actually talking about this because we have a different mindset. The 43 people in the other group that I'm, you know, that's preparing the, the open letter, they are also, they also have the, a different mindset, you know? How do we make sure that, um, aside from these six people and the 43 people in your group, how do we bring everyone else um, on board in order to, to address this um, in an open-minded way, you know? Because, you know, there was this quote of Franz Fanon. Um, he would say that um, the colonial power uh, made sure that we believe we are weak and, and stupid. It's not really what he used, but you know, just to highlight this and stupid. Um, but the truth is, if we found, if we find so, if we find um, within ourselves the power to claim who we are, then we become dangerous. Now, I don't believe that you know any of us has has already find the person that you know they want to be or they aspire to be. Um, but we already have a mindset that brings us closer to other people, right? So how do we make sure that we bring um, our peers 
to to this kind of reflection i think what we are doing now is one of the steps or it's one of the ways we uh, one of the ways we can use to educate some of our colleagues uh, another tool we have now which is very useful is social media mm -hmm. now we should try those of us with this idea with this fire burning within us you know the likes of Carmen Chroma, uh, all these guys they were all pan-africans so for the change that we we hope to see to i mean really come into existence it starts from here those of us in the diaspora mm -hmm. because we felt, we felt what uh, what life is at home and what life is over here so one we have to use all the platforms we have to educate people but first one of the most important tools we need now is our education system what i always encourage the guys around me is we have to work hard we have to be successful and if we have to find our ways to become opinion leaders in our communities and in our societies now i was in china four years ago i went to a village to teach i was the first uh, black person to be in that city it was horrible i must say that but what i realized is that in their textbooks sorry yes, in, uh, maybe <laughs> yeah children in grade one or even the nursery if you see the kind of pictures that they are showing them about africa they are using pictures dated back to the 60s or the 70s pictures where young ladies in africa they have no shirt on they have no bras on pictures that we see people in the bush in the jungle those are the pictures they used to teach their children so right from that infant age, they make us inferior to these children. They make the children know that they are the best and we of the black skin, we are the least people in the world. So these children grow up with this mentality. That's why they don't respect we the blacks because of what they've been taught. In that point, who, who, whose responsibility is it to because you know, as as a teacher, as a teacher, um, you teach what um, what you're given, right, or what you learn. That's the whole process of teaching. You're teaching what you learn, right? Yeah. Um, whose responsibility is is it to you know to update to update them? Now, <laughs> quoting uh, uh, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. I'm talking, yeah, to white people about race. Um, maybe uh, it's time for us to stop uh, trying to make ourselves understood, you know. But in this specific case, the one you just mentioned in China, okay, don't you think that it will be interesting for us because you know. We have a lot of black people all over the, you know, social media, TV and everything. So, yeah. You know, uh, not being aware of uh, who are black people and, you know, um, that we don't live in huts, that we don't, uh, we don't live in trees, you know, uh, that we are modern people, quote, unquote, of course, whatever they call that. Um, it's inadmissible for uh, a professor, a teacher, to teach uh, when they're teaching about us and our culture to make it sound like we are primitive people, right? So whose responsibility is it to update them? Is it our government, you know? Because as this is the thing, when you have a diplomatic mission, your diplomatic mission's job is also to showcase your culture in the host country, right? So for example, the embassy uh, of Ghana in, uh, in China, is, in, is responsible to showcase what China, what Ghana is, you know, um, so that Chinese people are attracted to go to, to Ghana and vice versa. I believe like in this case, like for instance, it's true that uh, because of history purposes, Africa couldn't, couldn't due to history uh, record be at the same pace with Europe or other continents because they were enslaved. So they, the fact that they finally 
was able like they were able to free themselves made them ahead of like behind of time however what i believe is that we live in a generation that's thankfully we are rising like we have more youth that are studying more youth that are learn like people who have attended not just secondary school but universities have their master's degrees phd so in the span of 20 to 50 to 100 years mm -hmm. there will be the opportunity for the face of africa to evolve so like in the same way like the evolution of africa determine a certain image of africa that today they are teaching in in they are teaching it in villages in china mm -hmm. when the face of africa will change and it will change it will change like <laughs> it will change when the face of africa will change okay then like it's like a matrix effect. <laughs> then that kind of image cannot like will not sustain any longer just as we cannot think of the british as people with white caps uh on their head as we used to think of them the same manner they will not be able to think of us as people who go around without brows on and you know just shouting hey, le, 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 around so <laughs> this was for my south africa people <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, no i really have a crazy yeah. south african friend and she can she can go crazy when she wants <laughs> anyways yeah so that's my opinion yeah as uh hannah said it will it will take time i think some of we the youth sometimes we want an instant change someone like me i want the whole world to turn over like just uh, on a blink of an eye which is not possible so maybe with time things will change however as i said in in those instances what i did was i was able to educate the people show them some pictures i mean I, I was able, could you imagine, someone asked me, how did you come to China? Do you have rice in Ghana? Do you eat bread in Ghana? Yes, these are questions people ask me personally. And sometimes, you know, <laughs> so if you're not patient enough, sometimes you respond in an anger, but they are naive, they didn't know. And with our presence over there, I think day in and day out, things are changing. Uh, in the past years, I've been seeing pictures from maybe uh, Rwanda, if you go to Kigali, they have some images showing around it. And Africa is changing. Africa is changing. Now, the only thing we need now is the support of our leaders. They should try to come up with I mean, better initiatives. Because sometimes we, it, it seems like they have become they are so weak to effect some of these changes. Recently about what is happening in China, I didn't want to go there, but since I'm talking about China, let me just uh, finish from there. About some of these videos that we are seeing, people are being rejected from going to the shopping malls, the supermarket, even McDonald's. They put a notice on their, one of their uh, restaurants that blacks are not allowed over there. Now we make, uh, people make complaint, Union you know, over there, in Ghana, for example, they made they channel their grievance to the ambassador. This is the kind of discrimination we are facing. And the response that came from the ambassador is those who are going through that situation are people who visas have already expired. Just imagine, even if their visas are expired, you as the ambassador or the head of commission uh, missions, it's your job to ensure the safety of your people. But if you see the comment he, he gave up, that was so, I mean, I was so pissed when I saw the official letter released. We all saw these things on social media. People are not allowed to go to certain places in China. And all what our um, uh, ambassador could say is these people are people without uh, genuine documents. The change will come. The youth are fighting harder and stronger. But then we need our leaders also to take good measures and good policies. Please do not criticize President uh, Mangu fully. Go ahead, Annette. Right. <laughs> um, something I wanted to, to, to add 
to this conversation and then maybe we can move on to what you guys think about the RFIGs is on top of all this discussion that we've had, I think at some point, maybe it was Eunice, I remember, but one of you said like it goes both ways. For example, the way Erasmus is explaining the, the Chinese, like the, the experience that he had, between them and us, it would seem as though they are the ones that are illiterate and not us. But what we're trying to do is to, is to educate them. I don't know if I'm making sense. As in, the way they, like, it's them that are illiterate, not us. We know our, our history, we know the world, we know that Chinese people don't don't do these cases. We've done our part, we've learned, we know about the world and they don't. So why is it our responsibility to teach them about us? Why is it our responsibility? Okay, so our responsibility of everyone to teach, but I'm saying from a, from a aspect of them perspective, it, like the way we're explaining it, we seem as though we're at fault for people's illiteracy or ignorance. It would seem as if it's our fault that people are not aware about us. I don't think, I don't, personally, I don't think that's, that's correct. Like, for example, you, you're in class, even maybe let's say today, or you're in class and you know, so like you know more than just about, let's say, your country. You know about Europe, you know about Asia, you know about America, and somebody else, maybe from the Western world, has no idea. It's not their fault that they don't know about that. But it's not our job. I don't think it's our job. I'm going to play devil's advocate. So Annette said that we need to, we need, we, we don't need to um, educate them on, um, on, uh, on who we are. So I am going to play devil's advocate. I hope the comment section doesn't kill me. Um, if you've only heard of somebody, you've never met them. Wouldn't it be better for that person to tell you more about themselves? Like Annette, um, all I know about you is your name, right? And that you're from Tanzania, right? Yes. Remember how I always told you were from Ghana? Yeah. Yes, until you tell me you were from Tanzania, you kept on repeating. Was it my responsibility to go and look you up and try to find everything about you? And then meet you so that it doesn't be uh, it doesn't become awkward, or do I get to make a mistake, right? And you correct me. Oh, so you think this? You are you? This is not the same. This is not the same. So then we never get. It's not the same. I don't think it's the same. You have to agree to disagree. I don't think it's the same as somebody. Introducing themselves to you and you, and, and you doing vice versa is the same as a whole country refusing to upgrade their education system. It's completely different, I think. And I, I, I totally support our sister because it's, um, when you talk about the edu educational system, it does not just come from a person. Mm -hmm. This is the whole educational system, meaning that the people have sat down to come up with what they should teach the people. And uh, as we know, China is a communist country, so everything is dictated. It's not really out of uh, the democracy or out of thinking out of the box. And we know as di how dictators rule is by taking hold of the information that people hear each day. That means it's actually intentional that the people have these kind of information. I mean, does that also justify the fact that in Europe, even though they know about Africans, it's still, it's still our race is still as African even to the highest uh, and educated people, they still are very racist towards African. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I really don't think it is, it is the fact that we are not teaching them enough. I think it's, it's intentional. And I, I think it's, it's about time we saw it as it is, that it's really, really intentional. And we did something about it though. Good. Erasmus was first. 
Okay. So I didn't finish my whole sentence. No, I went deep into China and I, I got lost. I was coming to land on the point that we have to, I mean, restructure our educational system. For example, now in Ghana education system, we don't have history. History is now like elective course for those who will be studying uh, general arts. And even it's optional. So from the young age to maybe the high school, we don't study history about even what, what we went through. Yeah. So it's like we the young people, the new the new generation coming, if these people are not educated, if these people are not told the story, the reasons, our culture and our past, they will miss the point. Because now Africa, we, we are imitating the West with no regards or no reference to the past. Having said that, I think uh, if when someone is racist, it's individual character. It's like trying to change a fool. Sorry to use that word. There's no way you can change a change fool unless he himself changes. That's how it is. So if when someone is racist, it's difficult to change that person. And on what Annette said, yes, we cannot change them globally, or you cannot change the, the entire nation. But once you change the mindset of one person, this person will go ahead and change the mindset of his household. And then just like the spread of COVID-19, by contact. So. <laughs> OK, sorry. Eunice, I know you had your hand up. Just to answer, Aras, uh, first of all, it is, I think that history thing is country specific. You said Ghana. Uh, some countries still have the history class going on, I think, like ours, for, for instance. But what I was trying to say with the China thing is that uh, I'm, in simpler words, it is not our responsibility. Like we have a bunch of other things to worry about that we should work on, starting from our own, of course. But it is not our responsibility to upgrade an education system of another country. That's what, in simple terms, that's what I was trying to say. Oh, okay. I was being people's advocate here. I hope everybody. No, 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 no. Yeah, just point of correction. I was talking about our education system, not the other person. I thought I talk about China, like how China sees us. You know? No, 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 no. I was focusing on how we are going to change our education system. For example, as uh, I told you, Chinese are now teaching their kids with history, like all stories of Africa. We have to install this discipline in our people, our children, your children, right from the younger age. We don't have to go to this level before we start learning. As I said, it's a, it's a business. We are in the business world. Every country is trading and everyone wants to make profit. And people will do whatever it takes for them to become the most powerful country in the world. And this does not exclude education. You train your people, their mindset. That's what China have been doing all this while, and it's working for them. So for Africa, we can also start by training the mindset of the people at the tender ages. 